the book of Galatians is all about the gospel, what it is and what it isn't. Once you understand those gospel things, you'll make smarter moves. It changes the game. Good morning, Grace Church. How you doing? So I'm Pastor Dan. I'm one of the teaching pastors here at Grace, and we are delighted that you're here starting a brand new series out of the book of Galatians. And today, we're going to talk about the true gospel and the false gospel and how much of a game changer it is when you and I understand and get and connect to the true gospel. We're going to talk about three ways that we drift away from the gospel And we're going to talk about how you can stop that in that process. So let's pray and let's ask the Spirit of God to speak to us and engage with us today. Father, I pray that you would touch everyone here in an unusual way, God. I pray that you would would surprise us by the Spirit's movement inside of us, that you would talk in a very clear and powerful way. Lord, I pray for that to happen. I got to get out of the way, so give me the ability to get out of the way so that you can speak to your people in a very concise way. And uh, Lord, uh, I pray that you would create a moment for us, that you would create a moment of change, that you would create for us a desire, Father, to live out and love and, and just marvel at the true grace of Christ in our life. Thank you in Jesus' holy and powerful name. Amen. So if you brought your Bible today or if you have a device, you're welcome to open it to Galatians chapter number one, and that's where we're going to start today. We're just going to look at just a couple verses out of chapter one, and uh, we're going to be looking at this amazing passage that uh, I think has such relevance for you and I today. Paul wrote the book of Galatians by the divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He wrote the book because the churches, it's not one church, but the churches in the region of Galatia were drifting away and false teachers were beginning to infiltrate the churches that had been established in that region. So now Paul is dealing with false teachers that are among the church. And uh, so I'm going to just tell you, honestly, there will always be false teachers in every church. And so I'm here to to warn you and teach you and show you how to recognize what is false teaching and what is not false teaching. So we're going to start in Galatians chapter 1 and verse number 6. And this is what Paul says. He says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to another gospel. Stop there and just take that in for a second. Paul says he's astonished. He is blown away that people who had received such dramatic and dynamic and powerful good news about how they they could be made right in the eyes of God for all eternity are now moving away from that good news to another gospel. Not that there is another one, not there's not another true one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. I noticed that last phrase. There are some who trouble you and want to distort the the gospel of true grace in your life. Now, according to this passage written by the hand of Paul, there are true there are two gospels, one true and one false. There is a true gospel and there's a counterfeit. So we need to make sure and I want to ask you to lean into this a little bit. You need to make sure that you're believing in the true gospel. Because you could, listen to me carefully, you could be in the church all the days of your life and go to hell. Because you do not go to heaven because you belong to a church. You go to heaven because you have been penetrated by the grace of Christ. So we need to lean into this a little bit and make sure that what you're believing is not false gospel. It's true gospel in your life. And this is so powerful And it is a game-changing moment when you actually encounter the true gospel. So let's compare and contrast a little bit the the true gospel and the false gospel. First of all, one focuses on what you do, listen to that language, and one focuses on what Jesus has done. One makes it all about you, and one makes it all about Christ and all about His work inside of your life. One focuses on getting God's approval somehow, some way getting God's approval, and the other one focuses on receiving God's love right where you are. 
You know, one of the things that I hear over and over again when I invite people to come to church, they say to me things like, well, if I showed up, the, you know, the building would fall in. And maybe you thought that. And, and, uh, but the truth is, is that's just because somehow, some way, you believe the false gospel. The true gospel reaches us right where we are, all full-blown sin, everything. God just meets us right where we are. He doesn't reject us. He doesn't, he doesn't condemn us. He invites us to come into a saving relationship to Jesus Christ. One focuses on an external duty. This is what I have to do. And the other focuses on internal desire. Here's what's happening inside of my life and heart. So as you can see, this is pretty important stuff. So let's talk about the false gospel for just a few minutes. The false gospel operates on the principle, I obey, therefore I'm accepted by God. If I I have the right level of obedience in my life, therefore God must be pleased with me. And I, somehow he, is, somehow he is, is looking down on me. And, and here's what is fascinating about this is that all the time I have people come up to me and say, Pastor Dan, I need you to pray for me. And I'm thinking in my heart, I'm thinking, yes, I'd be happy to pray for you. I'd love to pray for you. I actually like to pray. I'm not that great at it. And so what's fascinating to me is that somehow, some way, you would think that my prayer would be more efficacious than yours. That somehow God would listen to you instead, and, and, you know, and listen to me instead of you. That blows me away because the truth is that is counter gospel. We all have access to the throne of grace. We're all invited there. God invites us and he doesn't, he has no respecter of persons. And so it's not that like if you're a pastor, if you have a label of pastor on your life, that somehow God is listening to you more than other people or to you. And so it shows us somehow that we don't, listen to me carefully, we don't fully understand the nature of what grace is and how we've been invited to the throne of grace and how you and I can have this rela- relationship with God that is dynamic and amazing. The false gospel operates on the principle that I obey. Therefore, somehow if my level of obedience is up high, that somehow I am going to get answered prayer. And I- I'm just going to tell you, sometimes God answers my life when I'm in a mess and I'm disobeying him and I don't deserve it. Have you ever had that happen in your life? That all of a sudden, you know, you know, you know you're walking in sin and you're still praying and all of a sudden God answers a prayer for you and you're going, I'm surprised, God, that you would answer a prayer like that and, you know, and that's because we don't understand the nature of God's extent, the extent of God's grace given to you and I on our behalf. The false gospel says I have to clean up my act and then I have acceptance with God. I have to clean up my act. The basic operating principle of the true gospel is I'm accepted by God through the work of Jesus Christ. Therefore, I live in obedience to him because it's the only thing I know how to do. I just live in gratitude. And a grateful person just has a desire to please. That's the nature of the true gospel. The nature of the true gospel isn't that I obey and therefore somehow I am obligating God to do something for me. So here, here's how it kind of works. I want you to think about this. In medical school, they tell you that half of what you are going to learn is probably by the time you graduate going to be going to change because sciences, oftentimes information changes, what we understand about the human body changes. And, uh, and so the truth is, is that that's why they call it a practice in medicine because you're practicing on people like you and me. And, uh, but the, and the reason you're doing that is because, sci- it's because the understanding of science is increasing and increasing and increasing all the time. And what we used to believe, we now said, hey, you know, that may not be true. And you can see that by, you know, some days they say, caffeine is horrible for you. And then next week you read a report that says, wow, you need to drink more caffeine in your life because it actually, you know, has all these good things for you. So in nearly every field of knowledge, half of what is true today will one day be updated and will have better information. For every domain, every silo, every discipline, every, every, every school of knowledge, the facts inside of those things oftentimes are being overturned and augmented by and replaced by, by better, better understanding. And so in contrast, listen to this very carefully, in contrast, the gospel of Jesus Christ never changes. 
what was written to the churches in Galatia is written to you and I. And it never changes. It is eternal because God is eternal. There is no half-life to the truth of God's grace. It is full on. It is, you can count on it. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 8 says this, The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. I can count on the gospel. There's nothing else that I can count on in this life, but I can count on the fact that God's word stands sure and complete, and I can know whatever God promises me is going to come to pass. That is the nature of the true gospel. It never changes. It is always good. And when you have an epiphany of the grace of God, it is life transform transforming. It, it, it really is. And it's f far different than just having a, 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 you know, just a, a knowledge of, in the superficial. It's far more than just being religious. It's far more than that. It's when you come to an understanding deep inside your soul that no matter what you do, God loves you. Whether it's good or bad. God doesn't love me more in the midst of the things that I'm doing right as opposed to when I'm doing things wrong. He doesn't love me less when I mess up. And when that epiphany happens, it is so challenging and life-changing, it is amazing. But having said that, that grace of God is easy to drift away from. And in addition to that, there are actually false teachers in every church that come along and try to counterbalance the, the, the principles of grace. And I'm just going to simply say, if you're one of those folks, listen to me carefully, you're going to lose in the end because grace always wins. Grace always wins. So let me just share with you three enemies of the gospel of Jesus Christ, three ways that you and I drift, and three ways that the enemy tries to sow discord in our lives. Three ways. So first of all, the first one is the idea of legalism. The first countermeasure, and whatever God does, Satan has a countermeasure to, the first countermeasure that Satan uses for you and I, against you and I, is the idea of legalism. So let me just say that there are two kinds of legalism. And I want to define both of them. There are two forms of legalism. First of all, there's a first kind that I'm going to describe as condemning legalism. Condemning legalism basically says this. This is the kind of legalism that believes that a person is saved by complying to a set of rules, like the Ten Commandments. If I try to obey the Ten Commandments, somehow, some way, God's going to see that. And if I'm doing the best that I can, surely God would see and show mercy on me because I'm trying hard, right? That is legalism. Legalism says somehow, some way, if I can just take God's Word and somehow in my human effort try to live my life in the, in the, to the best of my ability, somehow if I get close, then surely God's going to grade on a curve, right? And I'm going to be okay if I just try hard to do what God wants me to do. That, my friend, is legalism, and it is evil. It is not righteous. It is evil. It's performance-based. And performance-based righteousness does not work. Performance-based righteousness does not work. And here's, I'm going to say something to you that it might shock you. But, uh, and if, you, you, if, if you've been here for a while, you've heard me say this before, but if you're new, you're going to hear me say it maybe for the first time, that as I'm standing here on this stage, I am as righteous as Jesus Christ is. Do you understand that? Do you know why? It's not because of my performance. It's because my righteousness is imputed to me by faith. It's because I have this amazing union with God through the person of Jesus Christ, and therefore my righteousness has been imputed to me. He became sin that I might become the righteousness of God in Him. So because my life is united together with Christ, and if you want to read more about this, read Romans chapter 6. It's an amazing chapter in Scripture. It, it, you know, it is, it is awesome, but here's the truth. I stand before you as righteous as Jesus Christ, and as you're sitting out there listening to me, if you are believing in a saving way, in a heartfelt way, that Christ is your only source of righteousness, then you too are as righteous as Jesus Christ. 
And that is a game changer. When you begin to understand and believe that, it changes the way you see others. It changes the way you see yourself. It changes the way you operate in life. It is a game changer in every way. It is powerful. But legalism tries to do whatever it can to destroy that. One of, one of my favorite cartoons of all time is The Roadrunner. I don't know if you've, if you've ever seen it, but I grew up with The Roadrunner, and here's the funny thing about The Roadrunner is that uh, Wiley Coyote, Wiley E. Coyote was always trying to get The Roadrunner, and he all, I mean, he did whatever he could, strapped himself to rockets, you know, jumped off of cliffs, did whatever he could, but here's in the end. It always ended the same way. It always ended the same way, and that was badly for the coyote. He could never, ever quite get his hands around the roadrunner, no matter whatever he does, no matter whatever he did. He couldn't catch him. Isn't that the human storyline? Think about that. No matter what we do, we are never going to beat sin and death. No matter what you do, you can't beat it. No matter what you do, you could never attain in your performance the righteousness of God that God's, God's Word would demand of you. You could never attain it. You're, you're, you're as guilty as the coyote trying to chase after something that's never going to be attainable to you. That's the storyline from Adam and Eve on, and it is, it, is, uh, it is a sad story in some ways, but a glorious story in other ways. And uh, no matter how many how many peace, treater, peace treaties that we sign or no matter how much relief efforts we give to people, the truth is, is that we can't fix what's wrong in this world and neither can you fix what's wrong in your life. Can't do it. Can't do it. And by the way, just so you know, so those of you that are health advocates, I'm going to step on your toes a little bit. No matter how many vitamins you take, you're still going to die. I don't care if you work out seven days a week. I don't care if you have a body like Pastor Dan. No, just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Just kidding. That was a joke. That was a joke. That was, uh, that was bad. That was sad. So moving right along, moving right along, no matter what you do, you're just chasing something that you can't catch. So the only solution is abandon the run and just begin to believe something that God says, reveals to us in His Word, and that is powerful. That's the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm just going to tell you, I'm going to remind you again, there will always be people who will try to lead us astray from the true grace of Jesus Christ and move us back into a performance-based type of lifestyle. While Paul was was at Antioch of Syria, some men from Judea came and arrived and began to teach the believers that unless you were circumcised, that would be a Jewish code of ethic, as required under the law of Moses, you could not be saved. You could not be saved. Those are false teachers. And as they were false teachers in those days, they'll be false teachers in our day. So if a church tells you you have to be baptized in their church to be saved, you run like the Dickens to get out of there. If someone says, you have to join our church, for you to be right with God, you, gotta become, you have to be our church, you have to be a part of our church, then you should run like crazy to get away from that. Because all of that is false teaching and distracts us from the true grace that Christ has. That's the first form of legalism. There is a second form of legalism that is just as insidious as the first one, and that is this. I'm going to call it binding legalism. So let me just, just describe the differences. This is a bit different because this would contend that even though you are not saved by works, now that you are saved, you have to live up to a certain lifestyle to keep your salvation. You have to live up to a certain standard that's as insidious as believing you could be saved that way. So let me read a scripture to you found in the book of Galatians chapter 3. Just so you know, I'm not making this up. And by the way, grace... Grace always offends legalism. Grace-based people always offend legalists. They always think we're teaching people that somehow, some way, that uh, performance uh, doesn't matter. And so here's the deal. Listen to this verse. Let me ask you this one question. 
Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? And the answer to that question would be no. No, of course not. You receive the Spirit because you believe the message you heard about Christ. How foolish can you be? He is now calling these Galatians fools because they are now believing this lie. How foolish can you be after starting your new lives in the Spirit? Why are you now, are, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? This is that kind of binding legalism. Normally, when you deal with a legalist, the rules are kind of crazy. I'm just going to tell you my personal experience with legalism. I was saved in a very legalistic culture. The church that I was saved in uh, had all sorts of rules and regulations and laws and principles. And, and I'm going to tell you, uh, that's how they operated. And then I went to a Bible college. I went to a Bible college shortly after that. And uh, after I was called into ministry, I went to this Bible college. And when I went to this Bible college, here were some of the rules. The rules were, first of all, if you were truly and genuinely a child of God, walking with God, you would, ne you would never have facial hair. And you'd never have your sideburns below your ears. That, of course, or your hair couldn't touch your ears if you were a man. And if you're a lady, you could never wear anything but dresses. And you begin, as I began to reflect on that, I, and, and again, I was saved in that culture, and God took me through a knot hole to draw me out of that culture. But the truth is, as I'm saying those things to you, you're thinking, most of you should be thinking, that's crazy. And if you're not, you're crazy. <laughs> you're crazy. If you're not thinking, wow, what was wrong with those people? But all of us have, let, let me just say this to you, all of us have some level of insanity in our life, some code of ethic that we're living by, that we're judging others by, and that, my friend, is destructive. Legalism always creates you, sets you up, makes you the center of the universe, and makes you the judge of everybody else around you. Because if others aren't doing what you're doing, they certainly don't have the kind of walk with God that you have, right? Legalism is a very destructive thing. And I'm just going to tell you, you, you just need to realize that legalism always produces death. It always does. It can't produce life. Legalism does not produce life. Only the Spirit of God produces life. That makes sense to you? So let me see if I can wrap this around your mind. There was a guy from the East Coast that had always dreamed of having a ranch with cows. And so he saved up enough money, moved to Wyoming, bought a farm, bought a ranch. And uh, eventually one of his friends came out to visit him on this ranch and looked around. And, and uh, he was, so he asked him a few questions about his ranch. And he said, um, so how did you come about? Well, what did you name your ranch? Everybody has to name their ranch, right? You have to have a name for your ranch. So what was your name? And so uh, the farmer said, the rancher said, I had a heck of a time uh, figuring out what the name of my ranch should be. So we finally settled on this name for the ranch, Double R Lazy L Triple Horseshoe Bar 7 Lucky Diamond Ranch. <laughs> and he, his friend says, wow, that's a pretty long, impressive name. And, uh, but I noticed that you don't have any cattle. What's up with that? And he says, well, every time we branded cattle with that brand, they died. And that's what legalism does, my friend. Legalism always, always produces death. And only the Spirit can produce life. We don't walk by the flesh or human performance. We walk by the means of the power of the Spirit in our lives. We depend upon Him. We walk with God by means of the Spirit. So here's what I would say to you. Throw out your rules. Just start loving Jesus with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul, and love others like that in the same manner. That's, if you want a rule to live by, that's it. Throw out your rules. That's the rule. Yeah, we have a rule here. Throw out your rules and just start living by loving God with all of your heart, mind, and soul, and then love others in the same way that you love Jesus. And if you do that, I'm, I'm telling you, you will find yourself walking by the means of the power of the Spirit. The kind of legalism that I'm describing will kill you. It will always live to self-righteousness, and it always leads to judgment of other people. So that's the first one. How are we doing so far? All right. Second enemy of the gospel, the second enemy of the true gospel of grace, is something that I have, I'm very deeply passionate about, and that is the idea of racism. 
Listen to me very careful. Listen to me very careful. Racism is, isn't a new idea. Racism is insidious. It is evil. And you're more affected by it than you realize. And so I just want to just take, slow the service down just a bit, and I want to talk about why racism is so bad and how God hates it in every way, in every shape, in every form that it, that it raises its ugly, monstrous head. See, here's, the, here's what scares me. There are these false teachers that came to the region of Galatia, and they believed that Gentiles, that would be you and me, folks like you and me, would have to be made into Jews for God to accept them. Now think about that. That God wouldn't accept a Gentile just the way they are, where they're at. They believed that they had to comply to all the external rules that they couldn't comply to themselves. And they had to be circumcised. They had to do all these, all these things. And so what I'm telling you is that that in itself was racism. They set themselves up as God's elite and not humbled by the fact that God chose them and then began to put standards on people around them and if they didn't comply they judged them. Racism is a scary thing and here's why. This was so inbred in their thinking. Listen to this carefully. These were religious people. It was so inbred in their thinking that they didn't recognize it when it, saw, when it, when, when, when it happened. They did not recognize that as, as racism. It's insidious, my friend. And here's what scares me. It scares me that we have grown up in a culture that is so inbred to racism that we don't realize how much it affects and how much it hinders the gospel around us. And maybe you should join me in a prayer like this. God, show me every part of my life that has any form of racism in it at all so that I can repent and I can turn from it and I can live the true gospel which God sends his message to every kindred, every tribe, every language. God is in the business of saving folks from, that look different than you and different than me. He's in the business of reaching people from the inside out and racism is evil. And I'm telling you, we are here at Grace, we stand against it in every form that we see it. And I'm telling you, it's still alive and well in 21st century America. We may not see it as glaring here in the West as we see it someplace in other regions of the country, but it is still there. And I'm saying to you, listen to me carefully, I would pray, God, show me if that spirit resides in me because maybe there's a blind spot in you that you can't see that's still there. Maybe there's a blind spot inside of you that you can't see. And maybe there's some way, somehow, and, and I'm just going to be transparent with you here today. I have three grandchildren. They are not white. And when I'm with my grandchildren, when I'm with my grandchildren and we're in a store or we're getting yogurt or whatever we're doing, I have this happen on a regular basis. I will have people walk in. They'll look at them. They'll look at me. They'll look at them. They'll look at me. And they're thinking something's wrong with this picture. I can see it in their eyes. They're saying, are these yours? Of course they're mine. Of course they're mine. They're my grandkids. I love them with all my heart. And yet I see it. I see it in people's eyes. I, you know, I, I just do. And I'm just telling you, when I first started, the first time I ever spoke on racism at Grace Church, I had a person get up out of their seat, run as fast as they could to the back door and slam the door and left the building. It is a hot spot, my friend. It is. And it is a, we live in a culture of racism. And so the church of Jesus Christ must stand for the gospel. And the gospel is for every person and every race and every kindred. And God, God is no respecter of persons. And I'm just going to tell you, honestly, that's something that is, I think, a blind spot in American culture. So I want to tell you a story to wrap this concept around your head a little bit. I want you to know racism is sin. It's missing the mark of God. And it, it's it, the root of base, racism, racism is bad theology. Just bad thinking about God and bad thinking about man. So let me see if I can help you understand how this kind of works itself out. There's a, this is a true story. There's a Dutch 
bicycle company that uh, sells bikes all over the world and they primarily sell them online and then ship them. And what they were experiencing was is a lot of their, a lot of their bicycles were being damaged in shipment. In fact, a huge percentage, like 40 or 50 percent of the bike, bicycles they were, they were shipping out were ending up having to be shipped back because they were damaged in the process. So they came up with this amazing plan to fix it. And this is what they did. The, the boxes that they shipped their, their bicycles out in uh, were about the same size as a very large flat screen TV. So they just began to label the box as it went out. They labeled the box, handle with care, flat screen TV. And listen to this. Their damage reports went down by 80%. Apparently what I label something makes a difference. Ooh. Apparently what I label something makes a huge difference. So if you're going to stand with Jesus, then you have to stand for what he stands for. And he stands against all racism in any form, in any way. And I'm just telling you that it's just the gospel truth. The third enemy of the gospel is bondage to the world. Commentators call this license. And it's the idea. It's the idea that you can get saved, that you can come to Jesus, kneel at his cross, and then I can go out and I can live my life any way I want to in bondage to the same way I was in bondage before. I can, if I was committing fornication, which is unauthorized sex outside of marriage, I could just continue to do that. If I want to live together in, without being married, I can just do that because I'm free, right? I'm free. That's bondage in and of itself. And it's an enemy of the gospel. See, when I come to Jesus Christ and I'm exposed to the true grace of Christ, it changes my desire. I now, not out of a sense of trying to please God, it's not out of that desire, it's just out of a sense of gratitude for what He has done for me. I want to live a life that makes Him smile out of gratitude. Not out of duty, not out of a sense of obligation. I just want to live a life that's free. And if you're still living under the bondage of the world, you're not free. You're not free. God came to set you free. It is for freedom's sake that Christ came. God wants to set you free from the power of sin, for its dominance over your life. God wants to create within you this amazing spirit of freedom where you're not controlled by anything except the desire to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. That, that's truth. That's word. That's spoken word. That's truth, my friends. And when you live that way, it's a game changer. It changes the game. When you truly understand and surrender your life to Jesus because of all that He has done for you, you'll find at that point true freedom when you surrender. That's what God's calling us to. That's what He's calling us to. Not living to achieve and acquire a bunch of rules and judgment. He's calling us to a full belief and a full surrender of what Christ has done. And when you live every day with the pure grace of God in your life, when you are so grateful for the fact that at your weakest moment Christ died for you. When you're living your life that way, there is genuine freedom for you. Isn't that amazing? But we drift back. We drift away from that true gospel. And as we drift, we find ourselves back in bondage again. May the God of grace, may the God of grace free you to live every day of your life, every day of your life, with the freedom that He offers you, maybe so in each one of our lives. Amen?